with a population of nearly 8 billion people. As humans take up more and more space on Earth, there's less and less space for other species to thrive. Nearly 30% of all the species on Earth have been assessed by the IUCN as being at risk of extinction. But thankfully, all is not lost. There are countless scientists working to save the species that we are on the edge of losing. In this video, we're taking a look at five species of plant and animal that have been brought back from the brink of extinction. Welcome back to All About Nature. On my channel, I try to bring nature-related content that's both educational and entertaining. If you like this kind of content, then please consider liking the video, leaving a comment, or even subscribing to the channel. I really appreciate your support. Off the southern coast of the U.S. state of California is a group of islands known as the Channel Islands. There are eight islands in total, each of which hosts a unique set of wild species, many of which are found there and nowhere else in the world. One of these endemic species is the island fox. Island foxes are closely related to gray foxes, which are found on the mainland, but they're as much as a third smaller than their mainland cousins. They live on six of the eight islands, with each island hosting its own subspecies. The island fox is the largest native predator to the islands, feeding on small rodents, amphibians, reptiles, and birds, as well as anything they can scavenge from the shoreline. In the 1990s, researchers noticed that the population of island foxes was declining quickly. They began to tag them in order to figure out what was happening. They soon discovered what the problem was. Another predator that once lived on the islands is the bald eagle. The bald eagles rarely bothered the foxes, as their main source of food was fish. But in the 1960s, the bald eagle population crashed, and they disappeared entirely from the Channel Islands. Then, in the 1990s, the much larger golden eagle began to naturally migrate out to the islands. While they had previously been deterred from the islands due to the presence of bald eagles, they were now free to settle there. And unlike the bald eagles, they don't primarily eat fish. Because of the historical lack of other predators on the islands, the island foxes had become more diurnal, being most active at dawn and dusk. But now, with the larger golden eagles on the islands, this was to their detriment. The golden eagles preyed heavily on the island foxes. Within only a short time, they went from hundreds or thousands of foxes per island to almost none. In 1999, there were an estimated 100 foxes left on Santa Catalina, fewer than 80 on Santa Cruz, and only about 15 foxes left on San Miguel and Santa Rosa Islands. And they had more problems than just the golden eagles. Canine distemper was destroying the population on Santa Catalina and introduced species like pigs, cats, sheep, goats, and even bison were causing their habitat to degrade across the archipelago. The species was critically endangered, but this is when researchers stepped in to take drastic actions to save the island fox. Wild island foxes were captured and taken into a captive breeding program. While they worked to increase their numbers in captivity, introduced species were hunted down and removed from the islands. Despite the fact that the golden eagles had naturally migrated there, the decision was made to relocate all of the golden eagles back to the mainland, and then to bring back the bald eagles as their numbers were finally recovering. The island fox population recovered quickly, and today there are over 4,000 island foxes living across the Channel Islands. In 1987, German botanist Eberhard Fischer came across a unique species of water lily in southwest Rwanda. It grew in the mud next to a hot spring, and Fischer gave it the scientific name Nymphaea thermarum. The pygmy Rwandan water lily is the smallest species of water lily in the world. Their leaves only measure between 1 and 3 centimeters in diameter, 
and it has tiny white flowers. It was only known to occur in one location, next to the hot spring. In fact, the only area it was known to exist in only measured a few square meters. In 2008, farmers in the area were looking for water for their crops, so they began to divert the water from the spring in order to water their fields. The patch of mud that the lily survived in dried up, and in only a short time, the pygmy Rwandan water lily was extinct in the wild. Thankfully, shortly before they disappeared in the wild, a few plants had been collected and sent to the Bonn Botanic Gardens in Germany. While the plants were successfully kept alive in the gardens, no one could figure out how to propagate them from seeds. Before long, they were down to the last two pygmy Rwandan water lilies known in the world. Meanwhile, in the Royal Botanic Gardens, Kew, in London, botanist Carlos Magdalena was trying his hand at germinating some of the seeds. He placed them in a substrate called loam, which is a mixture of sand, clay, and silt. Then he filled the water to the same level as the loam. Before long, he managed to germinate eight plants, and the following year they began to flower. It seemed that the species had been saved from extinction. Over the next 15 years, the lilies were sent out to botanical gardens around the world to ensure their survival, but they were still believed to be extinct in the wild. But what researchers didn't know was that the spring the species was discovered in wasn't the only home for the water lilies. In 2023, a population of wild Rwandan pygmy water lilies was discovered in a remote wetland. While this is good news for the species, it's still the only known wild population in existence. In the tropical forests of Central Africa lives one of the most interesting animals on Earth. Gorillas are gentle giants that spend much of their time eating plants and socializing in groups of up to 50. When outsiders first heard about the large humanoid apes of Central Africa, they were a source of mystery, having an allure similar to that of Bigfoot today. But in 1847, they were scientifically described, and the shroud of mystery began to clear. It turns out that there are two species, the western and the eastern gorilla, each having two subspecies. The western gorillas are divided into the Cross River and the western lowland subspecies. Meanwhile, the eastern gorillas are divided into the eastern lowland and mountain gorillas. Mountain gorillas can be found in two small populations in the cloud forests on the slopes of dormant volcanoes. They inhabit only a few nature preserves on the borders of Uganda, Rwanda, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Despite the fact that at least two of the parks were established back in the 1920s, their population has continually declined. Zoos around the world wanted to get gorillas, so the young were often targeted by poachers. In order to get the young gorillas, older gorillas were often killed. The human population in the region also increased significantly throughout the 20th century. This led to the fragmentation of their habitat. Farmers used slash and burn agriculture to produce their crops, destroying large parts of the cloud forest. And as humans encroached on the mountain gorilla's territory, diseases that were common among people and livestock began to be transmitted to the gorillas. By 1981, the population of this subspecies of eastern gorilla was down to as few as 254 left in the wild. Conservation work began. The first step was in educating the public on the benefits of maintaining a healthy gorilla population. Instead of farming their habitat or hunting them for meat, the gorillas could be of far greater economic value if they were preserved for tourism. Once local communities were on board, changes were made. The parks were expanded. Armed guards were hired to protect the gorillas from poachers. Snares were removed from the forest, and a highly regulated ecotourism sector was established. The recovery has been slow. But from a low of 254 animals in 1981, the mountain gorilla now has an estimated population of 1,063 as of 2024. 
This makes them the only type of great ape that has a population that is increasing rather than decreasing. Despite this, the mountain gorilla is listed as endangered, and all of the other subspecies of gorilla have continued to see a decline in their populations. On the salt plains and marshes of North America, there lives a large white crane that is one of only two species of crane found in North America. The whooping crane can stand as much as 1.6 meters tall and has a wingspan of as much as 2.3 meters. It's the tallest bird in North America, and the species gets its name from the loud whooping sound it makes. Evidence suggests that whooping cranes have always been rare, but after European colonization of North America, their population dropped to critically low numbers. It's estimated that before European arrival, the population was between 10 and 20,000 birds. This is significantly lower than the sandhill cranes, which likely numbered well over a million. Throughout the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, the whooping cranes were hunted and the marshes they relied on were destroyed. By 1860, the population had dropped to around 1,400 birds, and the decline showed no signs of stopping. In 1938, the species was in dire straits. There were about 15 left in a single migratory flock, as well as 13 non-migratory birds living in Louisiana. In 1940, a hurricane went through Louisiana and half of the non-migratory birds were killed. One of the surviving birds from Louisiana was taken to the Audubon Zoo in New Orleans, where she remained alone in captivity for eight years. She was named Josephine. Finally, in 1948, the decision was made to try to breed the birds in captivity. Josephine was transferred to the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge in Texas, and an injured bird from the migratory flock named Pete was brought in as her partner. In 1949, the two successfully nested, but their eggs never hatched. Then in 1950, Pete died. Immediately, another injured male from the migratory flock named Crip was brought in to try it again. That same year, the pair managed to hatch the first ever captive chick, which was named Rusty. But only a few days after hatching, he was killed by a bobcat. Josephine and Crip were moved back to the Audubon Zoo in Louisiana and housed with another male crane. The pair would go on to produce a total of 16 chicks, four of which would survive past 10 years of age. But none of those chicks ever managed to reproduce. The problem with the early captive breeding attempts was that whooping crane physiology and breeding requirements were poorly understood so researchers began to study the breeding habits of the similar sandhill cranes so they could develop safe and effective procedures for rearing cranes in captivity. Meanwhile, ornithologists began to educate the public about the plight of the whooping crane. They spent a considerable amount of time speaking with farmers about the species and asking them to not shoot the birds anymore. In 1966, the first breeding facility in the United States was established. At first, they started with injured birds that could no longer survive in the wild. Then, beginning in 1967, eggs from wild nests were also taken to be hatched and reared in captivity, using puppets and people in whooping crane costumes. After nearly 60 years of the captive breeding programs, the species has finally seen some success. As of 2024, the eastern migratory population stands at 73 birds, 48 of which were hatched in captivity. It's yet to be self-sustaining. Meanwhile, the western migratory population is doing much better, with around 540 birds migrating between Canada and Texas each year. With just over 600 wild birds, the whooping cranes are still listed as endangered, and the recovery is slow. But the species has come a long way from its low of only 20 wild animals left. With the ongoing work to help the species recover, there are hopes 
that whooping cranes will no longer be considered endangered someday soon. Along the southern coast of Brazil is an ecoregion that's home to a huge variety of unique species. Known as the Atlantic Forest, it's one of the most biodiverse places on Earth and has high rates of endemism. One of the endemic species of the forest is the golden lion tamarind. This species of primate is easy to identify, with its reddish-orange fur, dark face, and golden mane. While they're the largest of the tamarinds and marmosets, they're still smaller than most other species of primate. They live in groups of between two and eight individuals, and they spend their time searching for fruit, nectar, gums, and insects to eat. Unfortunately, the forest that they call home has come under extreme threat. The Atlantic forest once covered over 350 million hectares of land, but human activity has destroyed 88% of it with the golden lion tamarinds having lost as much as 98% of the forests that they once inhabited. Despite having several key areas of their range protected, the forest has been subjected to extensive illegal logging and mining. The golden lion tamarinds were also being poached for meat or collected for the pet trade. By 1969, the species was down to only 150 in the wild. In 1982, the tamarinds were assessed as endangered, and in 1984, 140 zoos from around the world came together to begin a breeding and reintroduction program. Despite the success of the program, the continued degradation of the species habitat meant that the IUCN reassessed it as critically endangered in 1996. Even so, the population of golden lion tamarinds continued to increase thanks to the reintroduction program. They were even successfully reintroduced to several preserves that they had disappeared from only a few decades before. By 2016, the species was back up to about 3,700 wild animals. While this led to them being downlisted again to endangered, the species is still under serious threat. The fragmentation of their habitat has meant that the tamarins spend more time along the edges of the forest where they're more likely to contract mosquito-borne diseases. An outbreak of yellow fever between 2016 and 2018 led to a 32% decline in their numbers. In the Poso de Santas Biological Reserve, they were hit the hardest, going from 400 down to only 32. This led scientists to develop a yellow fever vaccine specifically for the tamarins. And today, the population numbers seem to have leveled out, more work needs to be done to protect the Atlantic forests of Brazil, but this cannot be done without more awareness, better government policies, and in-depth education of the public on the value of this unique ecoregion. And that's it for today's video. Do you know of any other animals or plants that have been saved from the brink of extinction? Let me know in the comments below. I also need to say a special thanks to my patrons. Without their ongoing support, I wouldn't be able to produce a video like this every week. If you want to support the channel, consider joining us on Patreon. The link is in the video description below. And before you go, why not watch another video? Hit the thumbnail on the screen now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.